Statistics. Confidence interval T distribution when standard deviation of the population is not known. Get ready and some coffee because if we want to get realistic, we need statistics. You're not required to, but if you have first, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But, but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our, trust me, I'm an accountant product line. Yeah, it's paramount that you let people know that you're an accountant. Because apparently we're among the only ones equipped with the number crunching skills to answer society's current deep, complex, and nuanced questions. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. Access to this OneNote file, we're currently in the OneNote presentation section 1966 confidence interval T distribution when standard deviation of the population is not known tab. Looking at a scenario similar to recent example problems, except this time once again, we're looking at T distributions rather than normal distributions, which we will discuss more shortly. However, we have a similar situation where we're trying to find information about this large population. You can't test every item within the population because it's just too big. Therefore, we apply that standard strategy of taking a sample from the population, testing the sample, hoping that we can apply the findings found from the sample to the characteristics of the larger population to primary methods used to do this. One, hypothesis testing. Two, the confidence intervals. Hypothesis testing lending itself to situations where we think we know what that middle point is. For example, if we had a bag of peanuts that says on average, Average how many peanuts are in the bag of peanuts, then we can build our graph around that center point, take our sample, see if the sample comes out to a result that is far enough away from the center point for us to reject the original hypothesis. With confidence intervals, it lends itself to situations where we don't know what the middle point is. That's what we're trying to find. In which case, when we take the sample, we're going to make the average of the sample our center point, then build some kind of confidence interval around it. We could still use hypothesis testing as a way to do that by basically saying, if this is the result I got from the sample, let me make a hypothesis maybe that this number over here is the actual mean. I don't know that, but I'll just make the hypothesis, build my graph around this number, and see if the actual result I got is far enough away for me to reject this hypothesis. I can repeat that process of hypothesis testing for each of these numbers, creating an interval which would be like peak to peak, for example. But it would be easier if we can just take the center point here and build a graph around it using, if not normal distributions, then a T distribution type graph to create our confidence interval. Now, if we had the standard deviation within the data, then it's more likely that we can use the normal distribution and use the central limit theorem in a similar way as we have seen in the past. However, if we don't know what the standard deviation is of the population, then it's more likely that we would have to be using T distributions. T distributions are gonna look similar. Uh, they have a, the same symmetrical kind of shape, but there's gonna have fatter tails on the T distributions. Remembering that there are multiple T distributions depending on the degrees of freedom, which we will talk about shortly. It used to be that to use the T distributions, you'd have to like look up the graphs and charts and so on so that you get the proper graph. But in Excel, of course, the Excel system can choose the proper T distribution graph based on your data input, which includes the uh, degrees of freedom. So what we need to understand is kind of what is happening with regards to a T distribution, the multiple graphs that could be used and how that differs from the normal distribution. And then of course, when to use the T distribution, which could be in situations where we don't know the standard deviation of the population and possibly in situations where our sample size is relatively small.
if the sample size is relatively small, we are in danger of the central limit system uh, not kicking in the central limit theorem because we don't have enough data possibly for it to basically kick in making the bell-shaped curve even if the original data was not bell-shaped. Therefore, if we have a small sample size, we're hoping that the actual data itself has a, a bell-shaped curve, which will make it a more accurate kind of system. If the sample size gets large, then, uh, then you possibly could still use t-distributions, but the shape of the curve is going to get closer to what we would expect from a normal distribution as the tails get a lot smaller when, uh, when the sample size goes up, resulting in the degrees of freedoms uh, going up. So remember the idea here that if the tails are larger in a T distribution than a normal distribution, that means there's going to be more area under the tails over here, which means that uh, you will recall in a normal distribution, for example, around 95% of the data is within two standard deviations around the middle point when we're measuring in Zs, which are in standard deviations, which we can also measure in Xs. Uh, converting the Z's to X's, for example. And that means 5% would be in the tails about and about 2.5 in each tail given it is symmetrical. With a T distribution, if the tails are fatter, then you're going to need a larger interval greater than two, dis two standard deviations. And they are not going to be called standard deviations in terms of Z's now. We're going to call them uh, T's, right, for the T distributions to have a wider distribution, which is what you would expect uh, in a situation where you're less sure you would need a wider distribution to get the same level of confidence in that middle point. So that's the general idea. All right, so let's get to our scenario here. So we've got confidence intervals, uh, and we're supposed to say the standard deviation is not known. It's not, and I'm gonna delete that, it's not known. So we're gonna say the rating of movies. So we'll just imagine that we have movie ratings uh, that we are dealing with and we get, we're going to rate the movies this time in a 1 to 10 rating. So you can, get a, you can give a movie a 1 to 10. Now, I'm, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but the Hollywood movies these days are not that good. I don't know. Maybe it's just me, but I'm assuming for the purposes of our example problem that the ratings have been pretty low lately. We seem to be in a lull point with regards to movies, just to let you know how the story is going here. So then we have our calculation of, uh, remember, the, we have the standard deviation calculation of the actual data, which we don't know, the standard deviation of the sample, but which could tend towards the actual data, uh, but, and then, but we might have a small sample, and then we have this idea of the standard deviation of all possible combinations of sample of whatever sample size that we are taking. That's the thing we typically use to create our graph because it's the thing that if we had enough data would tend towards the central limit theorem creating a bell-shaped curve even if the actual data was not large enough to create a bell-shaped curve. The formula here for the, for the standard error that calculation is here. It was the 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 uh, sigma which is the standard deviation of the population but in this case we're imagining we don't know what that is therefore we're going to replace it with the standard deviation of the sample divided by the square root of n which is going to be the sample size now remember that if we have a small sample the central limit theorem might not kick in for us which is why we're hoping possibly that the actual data itself already tends towards a bell-shaped curve which hopefully will give us more accurate results even with a smaller sample size all right t distributions used if data is normal shape uh, or n is large enough and the standard deviation of the population is not known so that's going to be when we're going to use it, which we've discussed a bit. Now, this is what we know kind of behind the scenes. We, as the viewer of the movie, uh, this being a movie, we're doing a, a, a problem about movie reviews. But if we imagine this as a movie, we're like directing a movie here. This is the behind the scenes information that we know that isn't known in real life. That's why we would have to take a sample. So we're going to generate the data. I'm imagining we generate it in Excel saying, hey, look, the mean is going to be three. 
meaning three out of 10 is the average rating for the movies because they're really bad lately. So that's my story here. I think it's pretty accurate. These aren't actual numbers, but I feel like that seems somewhat correct. And then the standard deviation of, of the uh, input is gonna be 2.5. I'm gonna use that in Excel. We're gonna imagine that we used the data analysis, which if you were to use Excel, you'd have to turn on. You can look up how to turn that on in, in multiple resources. We work this problem in Excel in another course or section if you want to get into that in more detail which of course will be longer presentations as we map this whole thing out in excel but we'll give you the the general idea here so that's going to give us then our data so what i did is do a random generation now they weren't completely random because we used the data analysis and said give me random numbers that are going to be around a center point of three uh, with a standard uh, deviation of the population of the 2.5. This is what they gave us. Now, notice that these numbers do not mirror exactly what you would expect from a movie review because you can't have like a 0.79, so on, so on. It has to be rounded numbers. So what I'm going to do is take all these numbers and round them. So now I'm going to round those numbers. So now I get kind of movie review numbers, but we still have a problem because we have these negative numbers and although I think a lot of the movies these days really deserve negative numbers, like, like people are like, dude, that movie was so bad. Like I want to give it a negative number, but you can't do that, right? That's not how the rating system works. So we got to get rid of those. So I'm going to say an if function, I'm going to say, take these rounded numbers. And if uh, the number is less than zero, then you're going to put a zero. If not, you just give me that number. So now I've adjusted it so that there's no zeros. We've rounded all the numbers to whole numbers between one and 10, which you would expect would result in possibly the mean of the actual data now being over three. So let's, look, let's use this as our data now, and I'm gonna recalculate our data. So the count of the data is just this function. We're gonna count the information there are 500 in our population. We just use 500 because it's not too large, but it should be large enough to give an actual data set that we can pull from for the sample. And then obviously in, in real life, in the movie industry, there would be a lot more people than that. We could add a lot more rows even in Excel. But again, I want to give enough data for us to, to see the full data set of 500 so we can practice with it. The mean of the population is just going to be the average of all of these numbers now comes out to 3.06. So we told it 3.3. Uh, so it was pretty close still, even after we adjusted it. And then the standard deviation of the population, which is a formula STDEV of dot P of the population is 2.27, which is still fairly close, different, most likely because we adjusted it with these two kind of adjustments. So this is gonna be the actual data that we're assuming the real data of the population, the behind the scenes information, the standard deviation, of course, measuring the spread of the data. So now we imagine that we take a sample uh, of that information, sampling that information. We're gonna say over here, we did a sample and, the, and there's a couple ways we can do the sample. In Excel, if we had these numbers, I could just take the top numbers as my sample since these were randomly generated. But I could also put a column next to this, enter random numbers using a random number generator, which allows me to shuffle these columns randomly. Or I'm going to do it this way with our nice index function saying, give me an index. And then I select this whole column. And then I say, give me a random number between the, and this would give me the rows one and 500. So these are pulling random numbers, random movie reviews, each review between one and 10. And so now we have our sample data. So now that we have our sample data, we can look at that information. So we're in universe now. We don't, in universe, we don't know the red numbers. We do know the blue numbers. Let's see what we can get from those blue numbers. And then we can, in our, we can, from our perspective, we can see how close that is to the actual data. So N uh, equals the sample count. So how do I get the sample count? I can just count how many of these reviews we got. 
that gives us 50. So 50 is not too small of a sample. That's a fairly decent uh, sample size. Usually if it's like below 30 or something like that, then that's when the central limit theorem might not basically uh, kick in oftentimes. So, but still we're using T distributions here. The T distributions are gonna be tending closer to a normal distribution with smaller tails, even at 50. And once you get up to 100, you're getting a, you're getting a lot smaller tails on it as well, making it similar or closer to a normal distribution. The degrees of freedom. The degrees of freedom are calculated by simply taking the sample count minus the number of samples. We only have one sample. There's the degrees of freedom, 49. Now, the degrees of freedom is the number that tells which T distribution we need to be using, which you would have in the past have to look up in a book, for example, which have different T distributions with different widths of the tails depending on the degrees of freedom. But in Excel, it'll do that lookup for us automatically and give us the numbers to the proper T distribution. We just want to keep that in our mind that the, it, the tails are different depending on the degrees of freedom. All right, X bar for the sample mean. So remember that we can think about the data as the actual data, which in universe we don't know, which would have the mean. We can think about the mean of the sample. That's what we took over here, which is the average of all these numbers. We can also imagine that we took the mean of all combinations of 50 out of the population of 500, which we don't actually do, but that's kind of what we imagine that we're doing with the standard deviation. All three of those numbers should tend towards the mean of the actual population. So our actual population mean is 3.06. And we took a 50 sample out of 500 and got 3.08. So that's pretty good. And so then we're gonna say the standard deviation of the samples. Notice this formula is a little bit different than what we use for the standard deviation of the population. It's the STEV.S instead of P. And we come out to 2.37 versus the actual data 2.27 remembering that with the standard deviation spread measuring spread we could have the standard deviation of the population we could have the standard deviation of the sample which could tend towards the standard deviation of the population but what we'd like to do is get the standard deviation of every combination of sample size in of population 50 because that's the number that is most likely to be more bell-shaped and so that's what we're going to get to with the standard error calculation. Now the standard error calculation then is going to be this formula, which used to be the standard deviation of the population, but we don't know that. So we're going to substitute the standard deviation of the sample divided by the square root of N, which is the sample size. We can typically drop off the second bit if the large N, which represents the the population is large enough which it typically is so that's what we're going to do so the standard dv the standard error then is going to be the standard deviation of the sample divided by the square root of the uh, sample count which is 50. so this number divided by the square root of that number gives us the 0.3354 confidence level we're going to say is 95 that's the default oftentimes used confidence level remembering that that means that by chance alone we're saying that 95 percent of the time if everything is has gone correctly the the number that we come up with is the actual number is going to be within our range which means that five percent of the time it might be out of the range just in terms of random chance which we have demonstrated in a prior presentation. So the alpha is just gonna be one minus 95 or five. These numbers were generated by us for confidence levels. We could have different confidence levels if we wanted to be more confident. We can change this to 96, 97, and so on and so forth, which would result in a larger range providing for more confidence, but less kind of specificity. So then we've got uh, A divided by two is 2.5. So what does that mean? If we think about our, our range here, we're going to say that we want 95 in the middle, which means that the, there's going to be the 5% in the ends, and each end is symmetrical, so 5 divided by 2 is 
Now, notice that it used to be that within 95% in the middle would be around two standard deviations. But we're not talking about uh, normal distributions now. We're talking about T distributions, which have fatter tails. More of the information is in the tail. Therefore, to get the same 95%, we would have to have a wider range, which is the point of using the T distributions because we don't have as much information such as the spread of the actual population, the standard deviation of the population. So we need a, a wider range for a similar level of confidence. Okay, so now we're gonna, we're gonna wanna get the upper T. We're looking to put together our range now. So I know what the middle point is, uh, which is gonna be our average. And now we're putting together the range. So the T's are gonna be similar to Z's and that they're in essence the standard deviation. So our, our calculation is gonna be equals the T instead of the normal distributions dot inverse of the probability. When I'm looking at the probability, I want this 2.5. Now notice we took one minus 2.5 because I'm looking for the 2.5 on the upper end. Up here, we're looking for ba boom, the 2.5, otherwise I'd end up uh, with a negative number and that's going to be and then the degrees of freedom is the 50 minus how many samples which is one which gives us the 49 which will tell us what kind of that tells excel which t distribution is going to be used and that gives us an upper t of uh, the 2.01 so notice that means that if i want 95 percent of the data remember if it was a normal distribution it would be a little less than two standard deviations. And so here we got 2.01. That's basically in part because the sample size is fairly large for T distributions. 50 is a fairly good size sample size. And therefore we're still not, we're not too far away from a normal distribution to get 95% of the data at 2.01 rather than, rather than like one point nine six or something like that right so let's go back on over and say okay so that means that the margin of error calculation so now we're going to say our standard error that's going to be like our standard deviations our spread is point uh point three three five four times and we want 2.01 of them so times 2.01 there is rounding involved so that's about six seven four one about so that means that we can then get to our calculation for the limits uh the lower and upper limit by just saying okay what's our middle point the middle point of the graph is going to be the three the the three point oh eight and then we're going to say minus that margin point six seven four one gives us the two point four 059 and then i can take the middle point 3.08 plus the 0. 0.6741 is going to give us the 3.57 so that means if i looked at my graph over here you got 2.4 3.7 up here the range at this point i have the the 3.7 or so and then the 2.4 so 95 percent of the data in the middle I can measure the middle point is going to be the average. And then from the left to the right is around 2.1 standard deviations, which I can measure in the X axis around 2.1 down here. And I can also measure it in X's, which we just described are, are these ones. So that's why we have two X axes labels down there because we can measure them in Z's or in this case T's instead of Z's and in uh, the X's. Now we could do uh, a similar calculation with the going directly to the margin of error. So that would be margin of error calculation would be the confidence dot T. Now I don't use this as much because I think this makes more sense to me. It's like, but you can get right to the margin of error here using this one. And what you do is you take the alpha, that's going to be the 5% instead of the 
Then we want this the standard deviation. Now this is the actual standard deviation here, and then it will calculate, say like the standard error. We're not taking the standard deviation of the population because we don't know that. We're taking the standard deviation of the sample as the data input, and then and uh, the standard deviation, and then the size, which is the sample size rather than the degrees of freedom, which once again, if it has that data, it can calculate the other stuff needed to get to the margin of error. So we have that one. Once we have that, then again, we could do the same calculation, taking the mean minus the margin of error to get to the same number here, 2.459 on the lower X limit up to the 3.75, the middle point then plus that margin of error. All right, so once we have that, we could also calculate this information using the data analysis tool in Excel, if you have that turned on, and then we can go to the descriptive statistics, and then uh, and then you you have the range. The range would be we could just select this data. I selected the header as well, and then I told the system that the label there's a label in the first one is a header, so it knows that that's not a piece of data but a header. We can put it in an output range in our worksheet. And then we want the summary statistics and the confidence level, the confidence level defaulting at 95%, which is what we're using. But we could change it because that's just a default. If we want more confidence, we can increase that. That spits out all these numbers, the mean, the standard error, the median, the mode, the standard deviation, uh, sample variance, and so on and so forth. However, and this is great, but it's not dynamic, right? So it's not gonna change. And these numbers do not match exactly what we calculated over here because when I create the sample in Excel, I use it, I, I let it change uh, randomly. The random numbers will keep shuffling, which is kind of neat because it allows us to see, you know, shuffle the numbers around. But these, and so this stuff will all change because it's with formulas as we shuffle the numbers, but this, will not it is static so that's kind of the pros and cons it's a nice quick kick out of the information but if you're too reliant on this kind of thing you probably are going to kind of forget how to calculate it or possibly what it means so much uh, and it doesn't change in certain scenarios when you change the data input which you would like it to change if you're doing like modeling kind of stuff sometimes but those are the pros and cons with that all right let's make the good old graph so this time with the T distributions, I will typically list out the T's, which are similar to Z's. And you will recall that if you're building out your graph and you are measuring it with, with uh, the X axis being what used to be Z's, but are now T's measuring in standard deviation, the middle point would be zero. And then if there were Z's in standard deviations of a normal distribution, 95% would be two on each side, right? Now, because the graph had 50 sample size, it's pretty close to a bell-shaped curve in that the T distribution, 95% was, was in 2.01, I think it was. So, so that means that if I want a graph that has the whole curve, I, I, want, I could go out three standard deviations and that would be making an X large enough. If I go out four standard deviations, that should be large enough to fit the entire graph. That's why I'm choosing four T's being in essence standard deviations. All right, and then we calculate the P of X, which is gonna be the T dot disc calculation, which is taking the X, the degrees of freedom, which you will recall is N sample size minus one, which is the, the number of samples, which is 49. And then we do not want it to be cumulative. That's what the zero is. This gives us our percentages. So we can calculate that. And then I would like to have my X's. So if I know the T's, which are basically the standard deviations, we can use that to then get to the X's. So we can have our two labeled categories down here in terms of Z's and in terms of X's. All right, so how can I do that? I could say, well, the standard error, which is basically the standard deviation, the spread that the thing is built on, is 0.3354 times four. That would give us four standard deviations minus the middle point, 
minus the middle point, the average of 3.08. Uh, My stomach is growling. That's going to give us then the negative 1.74. So if I copy that down, I have to make an absolute reference here, absolute reference here. This one I want to go down as I copy it down. Then I get my X's. Okay, so that allows me to graph over here. But I want one more bit. I want to get the tails of the graph, which I could measure in terms of uh, T's or in terms of X's. In other words, I could say I want the T's to be between the, what did I say, 2.01, negative 2.01 and positive 2.01, which we can also convert to X's, meaning I want the X's to be between the 2.4 and the 3.7. So I am graphing then the middle point, the orange bit, the part in the middle saying X needs to be greater than the 2.41 and it needs to be less than the 3.7. Here's the calculation. If, and then I put an and function because there's two conditions that I'm going to be putting in. We want the X, which was going to be this number to be greater than the range, which I had over here, which is going to be this number and it's got to be less than that number. Those are the two uh, conditions. What do you want us to do if that's true? I want you to give me this number. What do you want us to do if it's false? I want you to put quotes, just a space, keep it blank so it doesn't graph. And then you can see it doesn't have it down here because I only copied down to here, but it would have the middle numbers once this number got above negative 2.01, it would start to populate, right? And that's the middle part of the graph. So that graphs the middle part, which allows the other bit of the graph to be the blue in the back. And because I have two graphs here, that's what allows me to assign two separate X columns to the sets of data. So if you want to see that in more detail, it's actually somewhat complicated, but it's kind of, it's a useful tool. You can, you can check our course or section out in Excel where we work these out in Excel. So bottom line, if we wanted to look at this, we could say the middle point here uh, in terms of X's is going to be 3.08, 3.08, boom, uh, ch -ch -ch -ch, as our middle point, 3.08 or so. And then uh, it's also zero with regards to our T's, which is basically standard deviations. And then if we go to the sides, we have in terms of, of the standard deviation or T's, 2.01, 2.01 on the positive and negative, that's going to be this one, and the lower and upper X's at the 2.4 and 3.7 or 8 about. So in terms of X's, 2.4 or something, and 3.7 or 8 about on uh, the X's. So hopefully 3.7 or 8, 2.4, I think that's right. So that's the general... Uh, that's the general idea. And of course, we can see over here that the result we got, 3.08, is pretty close to the actual result. And that means our, our range is probably going to be good. So 2.4 to 3.7. So is this number between that range, the actual mean 3.06? It's going to be uh, within the range, right? 3.06 is well within the range. If I ran this multiple times, which in Excel I can because these numbers are going to keep on shuffling, you would expect that if I did this a hundred times and kept shuffling the numbers, that about five times out of the hundred times, the, the this number would not be included in the range that's what it means to be 95% uh, confident level. And if I'm concerned about that and I want to be more confident, what do I do, of course, increase the 95% to something like 97%, uh, which would make this 3%, making a wider range, making it more likely that we will capture the data within our confidence level, but the range will be larger, therefore making it less specific.